Hello and a very warm welcome to this latest edition of Talking Germany, the show where we do just that. And my guest today is a remarkable man. He's crossed the Atlantic on a tree trunk. True story. He's been ambushed over two dozen times. Uh, he's been strangled by a python and he has even eaten worms. And here is that remarkable <laughs> man. <laughs> yes. Rudy Gnebeck, thank you very, very much for joining us here on Talking Germany Welcome. today. Now, uh, as an adventurer, Rudy Gnebeck made a name as the man who introduced survival training to Germany and indeed to the rest of Europe. In recent years, he's earned a reputation as an activist, a human rights activist, and above all, as an extremely effective campaigner against female circumcision. So, we've got a lot to talk about today, Rudiger, but I want really? to begin by talking about snakes. I love snakes. <laughs> <laughs> There you go, yeah? yeah? Why do you love snakes? Other people are frightened of snakes. Yeah. You love them, yeah? I think you lose your fear of animals when you know their strengths and weaknesses. I know that with snakes, I'm faster. I know that when they strike, I have to get outside a certain radius. I once let a five-meter python test strangle me. Why? Why? It bit me here. But I was wearing a thick jacket. It bites your neck and holds on, whipping its body around you. And I thought, is that all? I'd expected to run out of air. But it was just like somebody hugging me. But then I wanted to breathe and couldn't get any air because it was wrapped around me. I had to exhale more deeply, and immediately it tightened its hold on a rib. After 60 seconds, I was exhausted. I took it back into its room, and suddenly I was dripping with sweat. My heart was pounding, as if I were reliving it. After half an hour, the sweating was over. My heart was calm again, and I felt great, as though I'd had a fabulous massage. If you want to try it, it was a rock python. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. And we get, a, we get a feel for the way you work. We get a feel for how you, you in your life, you've tested your body. You've, you've, you've opened yourself up to challenges. And you made that your career, because your career, certainly to begin with, was based on what they call survival training. For our audience, give me a definition of survival training. What is it? Survival is for me... To me, survival means returning to the basic instincts of every animal that lives in the wild. In Germany, the term was unknown, even in the Bundeswehr. It was known to the SAS and in America. And I imported it from there, because I was enthusiastic about it. It extended my abilities to survive alone in the wild, in the desert, at sea, in the jungle, even naked. And that broadened my horizons so much. It gave me opportunities that later brought me to my human rights work. Because I became an eyewitness to dreadful proceedings. How the Yanomani tribes in Brazil were threatened with genocide. And now the crime of female genital mutilation. Okay, you've had your first impressions there from Rudiger Nebeck. Here's more. Rüdiger Neberg's living room is both his museum and where he refuels his energies. On its walls hang mementos of his many adventures. At an age when others are putting their feet up, Neberg and his wife Annette are planning their next project. The trained pastry cook says daily routine was never his thing. He's always looking for adventure. In the 1970s, he crossed the Danakil Desert in Ethiopia on foot. He crossed the Atlantic three times. Neberg brought the notion of survival to Germany, and he showed stressed managers how to live in the wild. You have to learn to overcome disgust and socially related preconceptions like worms are disgusting. You eat what you have to when there's no alternative, and these people taught me that. Life as an adventurer has its price. Neberg has been robbed 25 times on his trips to the ends of civilization. In 1975, on the Blue Nile in Ethiopia, robbers shot his friend Michael Teichmann dead. Neberg and a guide just managed to get to safety. 
That five-day flight was the longest unbroken period of fear in my life, because we always knew that they were following us intending to silence us as witnesses, so it couldn't be proven that they'd murdered him. Even after his friend's death, Neberg never thought about giving up life as an adventurer, especially a few years later, when it gained new significance deep in the Brazilian rainforest. One of the world's last indigenous tribes, the Yanomami, were under threat. Gold prospectors were destroying their habitat, Neberg informed the world, among other things, with his spectacular Atlantic crossings. After 20 years and a lot of to-do, the lobby was so big that Brazil had to change its constitution and really secure this territory for the Yanomami. Now they've been living in relative peace since 2000. Since then, 13 years have passed, during which Rüdiger Neberg and his wife found a new challenge. The fight against a crime perpetrated against nearly 150 million women around the world, and by which every day 8,000 girls undergo torture. Amina was one of them. Female circumcision is customary among her people. This girl had been subjected to this mutilation 10 weeks before and never uttered a word after that. She was struck dumb with horror, fright and shock. And that's what touched us so much. Rüdiger and Annette Nebag started the Caravan of Hope. Their aim is to awaken revulsion against genital mutilation. Though many people use the Koran to justify it, the book doesn't even mention this appalling procedure. In 2006, Neberg and his wife managed to do the incredible. They got together with the most important Muslim religious leaders at a conference in Cairo, and the leaders branded female circumcision a sin. The baker and doctor's receptionist from Rausdorf triumphed over a bestial 5,000-year-old ritual. I can't imagine a more wonderful moment. That was the breakthrough. Now the word has to be spread, and I think we can do that. The problem is that the good news from Cairo has yet to reach the most remote corners of the world. In 35 countries, girls are still being mutilated. Every preacher in every village should be announcing that this brutal ritual is a sin. Amina is also now helping. She's become Rüdiger and Annette Neberg's godchild. What was touching for me was that this girl, who was once struck dumb, can now offer her own daughters this triumph. She passes it on, and her daughters face a future without mutilation. We were very personally touched because she's been with us for such a long time. The Nabag's greatest wish is that everywhere in the world, people will know that genital mutilation is a sin. They've already saved this baby girl. I live for this. A wonderful scene at the end of a fascinating life. I'd like to go back, uh, Rudiger Neberg, right to the beginning when you were, I don't know how old you were. You, yeah, exactly. You were three years old or four years old. There are different versions of the story. And that was when you went on your first adventure. Tell us about it. I was, uh, I in Bielefeld and there had a great I was living in Bielefeld and I had a grandmother there who had dried apples. Back then, during the war, that was a sensation. I wanted to go there and got completely lost walking there. After two days, the police found me sleeping under a rhododendron bush and brought me home. After that, my mother kept a close eye on me so I wouldn't do it again. But at 17, I had my own bicycle with one gear and a small luggage rack, and I set out on my own again. I told my parents I was planning to go to Paris. I had a friend there and gave him 15 postcards. He sent them one every week, and meanwhile, I cycled to Marrakesh in Morocco to learn snake charming. When I came back, and my parents heard that I hadn't been in Paris at all, but in Marrakesh, they were really happy. And from then on, I was free to do what I wanted. Back to the beginning again. You were three or four years old. You were this big, and you were away from home for two days. Were you not frightened? 
I don't remember that day. Ich glaube, als ich so jung war, hatte ich keine Angst. I think I was so young that I didn't have any fear. And at that age, you're carefree. But later, when it was clear that I was going to the Blue Nile in Ethiopia, where lots of shooting was going on, an expedition of 70 British soldiers was shot at, that was another thing entirely. And I always knew and analyzed before every trip what might happen. And I tried to prepare myself for any eventuality by training for it. I learned to shoot from the hip. On the ocean with the boat, I had a shotgun that was like a machine gun because of pirates. I had enough drinking water. My tree was unsinkable. It was idiot-proof. And then this idiot goes from Africa to America because the currents and trade winds go that way, and I didn't have to do anything. You sit there and watch the ocean, and at some point you arrive. Und beobachtet den Ozean und irgendwann ist man da. Let's go back to the let's go back to that very early trip when you were 17 years old and you went to Morocco. We talked about snakes. You went to Morocco to learn about snake charming. Yeah, yeah. Did you learn how to do it? Yeah, ganz klar. Yes, uh, of course. The trick is, snakes can't hear, and when a cobra is frightened, it rears up, spreads its hood, so it looks bigger, and hisses. Und zischt. Und then you have it in a basket and open it. You stay at a distance because when the snake is up so high, that's how far it can strike. But not back there. And you have a flute to keep it at a distance. The flute has a large gourd at the end of it and the snake smells me with its tongue and then I play. It doesn't hear me, but the spectators do and they think, how musical. And when I start to move, it does too very symmetrically forwards and back, and that's the trick. You use the snake's natural behavior to fool people. We, we mentioned it in the report that we just saw, that uh, it was mentioned in passing, that you were actually, when you were still a very young man, you were a baker, of all things. You, the adventurer, were a baker. What more? Yeah. Why? <laughs> Being a professional baker wasn't fulfilling for me. It fed me, and I had to decide on a profession when I was only 15. It was after the war. We were hungry, and I wanted something crisis-proof. So I became a baker. But I always had the aim of becoming self-sufficient to stay independent in order to pursue my hobby of traveling on my own, alone in the desert and elsewhere. And I succeeded, but at some point, as I witnessed the terrible events in Brazil, my day job became a burden. And I was glad to sell my bakery and then spend all my time traveling for human rights. It's all very colorful, it's all very inspiring. It's fascinating to listen to you talking about it, but you just mentioned the fact that sometimes there were incidents that were very difficult to digest, extremely frightening moments, as during the trip on the Blue Nile, mm -hmm. when you lost a friend. Yeah. What happened exactly? The Blue Nile was seen as terra incognita, thousands of kilometers of untouched Africa. And that's what drew me. Crocodiles, malaria mosquitoes, tsetse flies, hippopotami, that was my world. And I built myself a boat that was crocodile-proof and unsinkable. It wouldn't break down. But then one day, after two weeks, we were waylaid. One morning, 12 people were standing there, all armed, their faces covered up, but that was normal. It was cold in the mornings. My friend approached them and wanted to say hello, and then they all raised their guns and started to shoot. They hit my friend in the head. He was dead on the spot. We two others, me and a Swiss man, realized it was serious. That was no warning shot, and we didn't know that my friend... Your, your friend was right next to you. Yes, but I thought he'd thrown himself on the ground to protect himself, but in reality he was dead. We reacted immediately. What the men had not seen was that we wore survival belts under our shirts, and that included a revolver. The cartridges were insulated against moisture, and after our first shot they all fled into the forest, and we could take advantage of their confusion to flee down the river. We were on the run for five days. Then we reached civilization and got in touch with the German embassy, and a manhunt was organized, and they caught the culprits. 
We talked a little bit about survival training. You were the person who introduced survival training to Germany. And you're telling me stories about hardships and adventures that you were on. When you do survival training, why do you do it? What is the, what is the threat? What is the disaster or the catastrophe that you want to survive? Yeah. It broadens my life. I can allow myself trips to places no one else can get to. Whether I'm alone in the jungle for weeks, alone with my own camels in the desert, or crossing the Atlantic with my paddle boat, or on that tree trunk. It's enriched my life enormously and given a new dimension to my enjoyment of life. Survival is medicine for me. It's my drug. I've never taken drugs or alcohol, the occasional glass of wine, but not to the point of drunkenness. My drug is adventure, planning trips for myself that no one else has ever taken. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, you grew up in the, uh, you grew up during the war, you grew up in the post-war period, you knew the Cold War, so survival is a word that is very relevant. In Germany today, Germany's a very Not relaxed sure, yes, country. Yes. No, a very comfortable country. Yeah. That's the better word for it. Is, is survival, survival training relevant in Germany today? It's becoming more and more difficult for people in Germany to survive because they've made themselves dependent on luxury, whether it's television, electronics, or computers. They're so dependent that when there's a power failure, their world collapses. I've saved myself in a sort of little oasis. When everything breaks down, I can survive alone for a long time. So what do you have? What have you organized? What... Do you have supplies in the cellar? Do you have food in the cellar for this emergency? Or what, what, what's your strategy? Uh, in right. German, please. No, if, if the electricity gets cut off, there's no electricity in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. What have you organized? What are you going to do? Uh, Say it's cold. If it were winter, I'd do this up and fill it with leaves or dried grass or other clothes. And then I'd have a sleeping bag, so I won't freeze. I know that I can go a thousand kilometers or four weeks without food. The colder, the more quickly the food is used up. And then I live off my own body, and I lose a pound a day. I've tried it all out on my own body, losing up to 25 pounds. And I know exactly how to test unfamiliar plants to see whether they're edible. I know where to look for food, and if it's about beetles and worms, I watch the birds foraging for insects among the fallen leaves. It's all edible. It's all protein. Rudiger Neberg, you've been, you've been battling against this terrible phenomenon of female genital mutilation for, for 10 years or so now. Where did it start for you? I read the book from Waris Diri, Desert Flower. And I was shocked when I read it. And I was shocked when I read it. I knew about the custom, but in the book I found out it's even worse than I thought. And then I found out that 90% of the victims are Muslim women, that every day 8,000 women the world over are mutilated, and that the Quran is wrongly used to justify it. Christians also practice genital mutilation, but only a few percent. And because I know Islam, I know that the fact that I'm here at all is due to Islam. The hospitality has always impressed me thoroughly on my trips. I've been attacked twice, and I would have been killed if my companions hadn't stood in front of me and said, this is my guest, if you want to kill him, you're going to have to shoot through me. So I owe thanks to Islam. I learned to avoid generalizations like when you hear something about terrorism saying all Muslims are criminals. I've seen the positive side. I saw the opportunity to get the highest spiritual authorities in Islam to declare it a sin. And because Muslims are very devout, I hope that no other argument will be relevant, such as she'll be prey to her animal instincts, she'll become a prostitute, or that smells bad, it has to be cut off. When people commit sin, no excuse is relevant. 
kein Argument mehr gelten lassen. Und dann stand fest, man muss die höchsten Geistlichen... So then I realized we had to get the highest ranking Muslim clerics together and declare the custom to be a sin. Everybody in Germany thought I'd lost my mind. They said Islam was not capable of dialogue. So on the advice of Amnesty International, I founded the Target Organization together with my wife and friends. They made us independent of all those cowards and skeptics. And we were successful right away. But the highlight was a conference at the Ajar University in Cairo. That's comparable to the Vatican for Catholics. And there, the very highest ranking Muslims in the world declared it a crime that violated the highest values of Islam. The Grand Mufti of Egypt even took over the sponsorship, and we thought the job was done. Then we found out that most people were not courageous enough to talk about it. The subject was still taboo. People don't even discuss it in their families. So then we documented the conference in the so-called Golden Book in several languages, a sermon template for the imams in millions of mosques. In a number of different languages. Pardon? In lots of different languages. Yeah, these are three, but meanwhile we have it in ten languages. Mm -hmm. But it is, as I said, a template for imam's sermons. And the Grand Mufti of Egypt, the second highest ranking cleric in the Sunni hierarchy, honored the book with a fantastic foreword. And imams were snatching it from our hands. But then again there was disappointment. Most don't have the courage to talk about it in the mosque. So now it's got its own website, which will at some point be in all languages, such as Somali. Because many Muslims, including Imams, can only understand Quranic Arabic and not spoken Arabic. Okay. Like everything else you've done in life, it's an absolutely fascinating journey and, uh, and you've achieved a great, great deal. I want to go back just a little bit though, first of all. Uh, this is a very old practice. It's 5,000 years old. It's a tradition. Yeah. And many people in the, in the regions where this is widely practiced will say to you, it is a tradition, it is part of our culture. But it's against God, it's against a woman, it's against any law, it's against God. And, and deshalb must this be That's why it must be stopped. When we showed the pictures to the clerics at Al-Ajar, some of them 80-year-old men, those brown-skinned men turned pale at the sight of them. Some had tears in their eyes. That's, that's interesting. Then that means that these men, they had never seen this before. This was new for them. So, Done among women or by a hairdresser. So, is it only women, only women who do the circumcision? Usually. Usually. Yeah. And it's there, it, it's there. They saw it, listened to doctors, internationally renowned doctors, who also said this is the greatest civil war of all time. For 5,000 years, people, men, against women, still claiming 8,000 victims a day. With infibulation, the most drastic form, a third of the women died. That's a UN estimate. And when they saw the pictures, these men summoned the courage to change the views that they had held all their lives. They declared the custom a sin. I bowed down in humility before those men. You have been, your voice, your voice literally has been heard by some very important people, yeah, in yeah. Egypt and elsewhere, in Cairo, yeah. yeah. Why, why did they listen to you? You're a, you're a white German yeah. outsider. Why do they listen to you? Yes, everybody says that to me. They say Islam is not capable of dialogue. They'll cut your throat. I say, all you read here is the tabloids. Just as with Christians, there are also criminals who annihilated the Indians, carried out the Crusades, practiced the Inquisition. There are always all sorts. But I've experienced the positive forces, and I intend to activate them. And now I approach them with respect, in humility. 
I go as a Bedouin to the Bedouins, so to speak, not like the UN with a big delegation, all of them dressed to the nines with their press spokesmen, where you have to think about every word because it's going to be in the media the next day. I go to them one-on-one. -on -one. I go as a man who's now old. Earlier, I wouldn't have been able to do that. And I've seen something of what you can change with the power of your authority. It's a crime. It's a mockery of your God and your religion. And then they see the picture and cooperate. Okay. And another, another point that we have to talk about is that, I mean, here in Germany, we have recently had a discussion about male circumcision, yeah. circumcision for men, yeah? And, and a lot of people say, OK, where's the problem? There's male circumcision, yeah. there's female circumcision. Yeah. We have... My association has a principle. We deal only with female genital mutilation, only with Islam, not with Christians, and not male mutilation, stoning or anything like that. If we did, we couldn't achieve our aims. And above all, I know from my own experience, I'm circumcised because I once had an infection, I can still experience sexual pleasure. A woman can't. You can't compare these two sorts of circumcision. Of course, there are disadvantages with male circumcision, but they're minimal compared to the crime perpetrated against women. That's why we deal only with women and Islam, and we're successful. And the other religions, Christianity and the others, will be forced to follow, because the patriarchs and popes could also speak plainly and say, we're not going to let that be laid at our doorstep. That's what Islam has now done. You went from the north of Germany to the south of Germany. Yeah, thousand kilometers. Thousand kilometers in 23 days. Yeah. What was... from my I lived off my own body. I had to drink from rivers, but I lived off my body fat and then muscle mass. I lost 25 pounds, a pound every day. What was the longest walk? What was the longest day? Was the longest day? Yeah, the, 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 ah, the how far did you walk on the longest yeah, day? Yeah. Uh, begin, At first, I did 50 kilometers a day. 50 kilometers? 50, yeah. 50, yeah. 50 five zero. Yeah. And as, ich immer as I got thinner and weaker, then it was just 30. Yeah. Only 30. Um, worms. A delicacy. <laughs> Protein, <laughs> fat. When you pull them out of a dunghill and wrap them around a stick and grill them over a fire, it's like stuffed cabbage leaves. It's all edible. You just have to know that if it disgusts you, you chop the worms into small pieces and eat them like pills. That's a mental process. You have to know how to feed yourself when necessary. Birds eat them and live too. And you also ate, you ate frogs? Yeah? 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 And yes, yes, but they're under a natural protection order now. I've given that up. But a raw worm tastes like raw shellfish. They're comparable. That's why we cook and season shellfish and worms. There's nothing better, except pumpernickel. <laughs> and, at, and at night you slept in a bivouac. Yeah? How did you make the bivouac? Yeah? Where you slept at yeah, night? Yeah, yeah. Hmm? I learned that from animals. You have to spend the night in the forest. No dew falls at night there, so it's warmer. I had a forked branch that was my digging stick. I made a hole in the ground, threw dead leaves into it, and nestled down. To protect myself from rain, I made a roof from leaves. That way you can get through the night quite well. Sometimes it was very cold, it was October, and I walked at night and caught up on sleep in the sun during the day. And what did you learn about Germany? I learned that people stood there and thought, he's got a screw loose. But for me it was the most important training. I wanted to find out how long I could hold out without food and luxuries. It was an experience I needed when I first intended to visit the Yanomami people in Brazil. They faced extinction from an army of gold prospectors. I wanted to approach the indigenous people through the jungle alone, naked, with nothing but a harmonica and bathing trunks, a signal to them right away that I was not a gold prospector, but a friend. So, so, so what happened? You, you, you left Germany, you went to Brazil, 
Yeah. You got out of the plane at the airport in Brazil. Ja. You went into the jungle. Ja, and ja you, aber, aber wie ein, you dropped to, wie ein normaler Bürger. Dann yeah. Yes, but like an ordinary citizen. Then I went up the Rio Negro in a boat. There I paid a fisherman to take me up the rivers in his little canoe with an outboard motor. 14 days on the edge of humanity. And there in a rainforest as big as Switzerland lived the Yanomami. And they'd almost been wiped out by 65,000 armed gold prospectors. Those guys had 400 planes, it was like an army, and everything was run mafia style. Everyone right up to the president knew. But back then there was no satellite imagery made public, otherwise people would have been able to see it. And then I came along, hired out as a gold prospector with a friend who secretly filmed it all. We showed the film to the World Bank, the UN, and gradually it ran on German TV at 8 p.m. Greenpeace was allowed to distribute it worldwide, and the film triggered a rethink. And after 20 years, with lots of campaigning in the meantime, a pedalo over the Atlantic and a massive tree trunk over the Atlantic, the lobby was big enough, and now they have peace. And then the topic of female genital mutilation came into my life. That was an important experience. I noticed that nobody, not even a listener, is too unimportant to change anything. You just need good motivation. I had that because I was an eyewitness, and a new good strategy with Islam, with positive people in the government of Brazil who respected the Constitution. Those weapons are invincible. I've got one of them in my hand. Um, I'm going to go straight to page 202, Rudiger, because I found something... My goodness. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And on page 202, in the book here, it tells you how to make a Molotov cocktail. Yeah, that's a cocktail. What's all that cocktail? about? Yes, it's not a cocktail to drink. <laughs> it's not a drinkable cocktail, but today you might think I'm a terrorist, but I'm really not. There are regimes and mafia-like syndicates that act in a very criminal manner. And in that case, a Molotov cocktail is an affordable way to defend yourself. You don't need anything but petrol, a lighter, and a little cloth. It always fascinated me with what simple means you can incapacitate a tank. I learned that you get into situations the way we Germans did with the Nazis, and we relied on the Allies, who freed us from the Nazis. And that's how it is with mutilated women. They can't free themselves from this evil. Help has to come from outside. And I've met great Muslim friends and brothers. We'll bring this to an end. I fixed on the year 2020. I may be dead by then, but then it'll come to an end. Okay, okay. We're going to talk about something, however, a little bit more peaceful now, and it might uh, sound strange, but I think it is fair to say that bread is one of the cornerstones of German culture. And we mentioned earlier that Rudiger Nieberg uh, was a long, long time ago a baker. Uh, so we are now going to talk bread, but before we do so, we've got a report on a traditional bread, sometimes called the Black Gold of Westphalia, but more widely known as P4. <laughs> It's not just Germans who like pumpernickel. This dark rye bread has long been an export hit, supplied to more than 80 countries around the world. Japanese also enjoy pumpernickel. On a guided tour through an industrial bakery in Gütersloh, they get to taste the product, though the raw dough does take some getting used to. The pumpernickel stays in the oven for about 20 hours. It's baked slowly in its own steam in closed containers at about 100 degrees Celsius. Because of the long baking time, the starch in the rye meal caramelizes, which gives the pumpernickel its dark color and sweetish fine flavor. Only rye meal, salt, water and sourdough starter go into the bread. Tastes delicious, moist, fresh from the oven. Sweet, very sweet. This flavor is typically German, I'd say. We don't have anything like it in Japan. It's heavy, keeps well, and it's very healthy. 
sehr gesund. Deutsche Brotkultur. German style bread is increasingly conquering the world. We have all sorts of different breads. Pumpernickel is our black gold, the black gold of Westphalia. Wrapped in foil, the bread keeps for several months, in a tin up to two years. Germany exports more than 1,000 tons of pumpernickel annually. Rudiger Neberg, are you a fan of pumpernickel? The greatest fan ever. <laughs> uh, I did it for years. A crispy half bun with butter and pumpernickel. I don't need anything else. Yeah. Yeah. And in your uh, survival books that we were just looking at, would pumpernickel be good in there? Is it a good thing to have in your backpack? Uh, in... The book deals with insects and plants and overcoming disgust. Pumpernickel has no place there. Okay. Uh, I've still got to ask you another bread question, a very important bread question. Why is bread so important to German people? I don't know. Why is tea so important for British people? Because it tastes so very good. Oh. <laughs> it's and it's so refreshing. It's difficult yeah. to, be, to explain it. <laughs> it's, a, it's amazing how many Germans, when I speak yeah, to yeah. them, and I say to them, what do you miss about Germany when you're away? When oh, you're at... Yeah, bread. Yeah, bread. bread. It's the first thing they miss. OK, we're getting towards the end. I'd like to uh, throw a, a, a quote at you. You have said, I am satisfied with my life, but I could have achieved more. Yeah. Und zwar bin ich ein Spätzünder. Ich bin I'm a late bloomer. I didn't realize until very late that nobody is too unimportant to change things that are wrong. Even if those things are historical or incredible in their dimensions, like female genital mutilation and civil war in the rainforest. And nobody, all the viewers and listeners of your show, should think that they're too small. If something bothers you, with a good strategy, strong motivation, endurance, and unfortunately also luck, you can change a lot. And I have one last goal before I bite the dust, because I'm 78, my time is ending. I want to convince the last influential Muslim, the King of Saudi Arabia, to have this wonderful message that mutilating women is a sin proclaimed in Mecca, at the city gates and elsewhere. It would make him immortal. In unsterblich machen. Have you any signal that he has begun to listen to what you are going to say to him? Es ist unglaublich schwer. Er wird it's incredibly difficult. It gets filtered. For six years, I've been trying to get to him via presidents of countries, princes and princesses, even in a British newspaper, where I took out a full-page ad, politely beseeching him, humbly calling on him, but I was dismissed. But I still have a few hopes that I can get to him. If he knew about it, I'm sure he would cooperate, because he would then not just help all these women, 8,000 every day, but also show the world that Islam will no longer let itself be defined by terrorism, but by the positive sides that every religion has. Okay, we've got one question, the traditional quiz at the end of the show. What's more exciting, traveling around the world or Sitting changing the world? here with you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very, very much. <laughs> that is all we have time for. It's a good way to uh, end. Uh, it's the, it's the, la the last words on this edition of Talking Germany. Our guest, Rudiger Neberg, the survivor. Uh, what a life so far. If you've enjoyed his company as much as I have, then do come back next week. If you want to find out more, check out my blog on the website. Uh, or you might want to watch the German version of the show. For now, though, tschüss. Ha, ha, ha.